Here's a poem by Deborah Berber, MBO member. Upon the velvet canvas of the night, a silver orb begins its tranquil flight. Observe the moon night with whispered grace, invites us to a cosmic starry space. As Luna's glow bathes Earth in gentle light, we turn our gaze to that celestial sight. In unity, we gather neath the sky to watch the moon, so ancient and so high. Its craters tell of tales from ages past, a silent witness to the cosmos vast. A beacon in the dark, a guiding star, connecting all who look from near and far. On this enchanted eve, our hearts take flight as we observe the moon with pure delight.
Here's a poem by Deborah Berber, MBO member. Upon the velvet canvas of the night, a silver orb begins its tranquil flight. Observe the moon night with whispered grace, invites us to a cosmic starry space. As Luna's glow bathes Earth in gentle light, we turn our gaze to that celestial sight. In unity, we gather neath the sky to watch the moon, so ancient and so high. Its craters tell of tales from ages past, a silent witness to the cosmos vast. A beacon in the dark, a guiding star, connecting all who look from near and far. On this enchanted eve, our hearts take flight as we observe the moon with pure delight. While we are all joining this event from our own location, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Boon Wurrung people of the Southeast Kulin Nation. We would like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations communities joining us today. If a child in the family wants to ask a question during MBO's live stream, it's best to have an adult ask it through their Facebook or YouTube account. This ensures the child's safety and adherence to platform age restrictions while allowing them to participate in a supervised manner. Thank you. MBO would like to clarify that our live streams will never ask anyone to register and give credit card details. We bring these live streams to the public for free. 
If you come across an MVO live stream that asks you to pay for it, it is a false stream and we ask that you report it. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone to a night at Mount Burnett Observatory. Whether you're tuning in from around the corner or around the world, I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who have taken the time to join us here tonight. It's great to have such a diverse and engaged audience. We gather here tonight to explore our moon. The moon, our celestial neighbour, has captured human imagination for millennia. It hangs in the night sky, a constant companion to our planet its mysterious allure shaping myths, science, and the arts. This luminous orb, just a quarter of Earth's size, exerts a profound influence on our times, seasons, and even our culture. It has been a symbol of mystery, wonder, and exploration. Our MBO panelists who will share their knowledge and insights about our moon for tonight's presentations are Saskia, Merv, Steve, Andrew, Jackie, G'day. Neil, David, Chitani, Ella, and we have an interview with our very own Braden Borg. All of us here, as always, would like to acknowledge our fabulous crew who are working hard behind the scenes on Facebook and YouTube. They too play a big part in bringing this production to you. We also have Denise and Adam, who are our producers for this evening. Throughout the event, we encourage you to engage with one another, ask questions and share your own insights and experiences in the chat. We have a planisphere to give away tonight to the, a question that we feel is the best question of the night. My name is Petra and I will be your host for this evening. Let us now embark on a journey of discovery and appreciation of our moon, a silent sentinel that has watched over us for countless ages. And to start the journey off is Saskia with Indigenous Astronomy Perspectives of the Moon. My presentation on the Indigenous Perspectives of the Moon. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the unceded lands and waterways I am on. I would like to recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and I acknowledge their ability to care for country and the deep cultural, spiritual connections they have. I acknowledge their continuing presence for 60,000 years, and I honour elders past, present and emerging, whose knowledge and wisdom ensures the continuation of culture and traditional practices. I would also like to acknowledge and welcome any First Nations communities joining me here today. In this presentation, I will go over why Indigenous astronomy is important and what it can teach us. First Nations communities saw the connection between the Earth's tides and the moon phases long before Western astronomy. There are many oral narratives and different interpretations of the moon across Indigenous communities. A common thread is how knowledge is passed down. This knowledge educates and informs and reinforces norms and behaviours. In most Indigenous astronomy stories, the moon is male, or the moon is called Dua. One story I would like to share comes from Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. The excerpts I'm going to show are from an ABC TV series called Dust Echoes. Moon Man lives with his two sons and two wives in a moonlight paper bark house. One day, Moon Man's sons approach him and offer to hunt. This makes Moon Man feel very happy. 
the sons caught lots of fish from the billabong. But instead of bringing it back, they ate it all and brought back only the fish bones. The sons offered to fish again and make it up to Moon Man. But instead, they did the same thing again. They ate all the fish and brought back only bones. This time, Moon Man is furious and devised a plan. He makes a fishing trap and he takes the sons out fishing. He beats the boys dead and throws them into the fishing trap. Moon Man's wives ask where the boys are and Moon Man claims not to know. The wives look for their sons and find, find them dead in the billabong. They know that Moon Man did this. They wait until he is asleep and they set fire to the moon hut with Moon Man inside. Moon Man tries to escape up a tree and cries that he's coming back immortal every month when he realises that he can't escape. The immortal Moon Man transforms into the moon and rises over the tree every month. Another story I would like to share also comes from Arnhem Land and is about how the crescent moon gets its shape. The moon is a greedy man and eats lots of food and gets very fat. The wives chop away at the moon and create the crescent shape. The moon gets skinny and dies for three days. But then the moon comes back and starts to eat lots of food and it gets very fat. And then the cycle repeats. A Yelonganu story from Arnhem Land is an example of indigenous knowledge and astronomy. This story explains the tides and demonstrates how the Yelonganu people understood the relationship between the moon and the earth in creating tides. When there is a high tide, water pours into the moon, creating a full moon. As water runs out of the declining moon, the tides fall. The tides then refresh this moon, creating a full moon again. A Moriwari story from the central New South Wales region is about Guyenne. In this story, Guyenne was an attractive young man who drowns and was then revived. Guyenne takes revenge and massacres those who left him to drown. There are some survivors and they go after Guyenne but Guyenne escapes into the sky to escape his crimes. Guyenne still lives in the sky. The Morawari say that during the lunar eclipse, the moon turns red from Guyenne's blood. Thank you for watching this presentation on Indigenous Perspectives and the Moon. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the presentations brought to you this evening by Mount Burnett Observatory. Thank you Saskia for sharing these precious Indigenous stories and knowledge with us tonight. Ever wondered how the moon was used as a calendar in ancient times? We now have Merv explaining this. Look at the moon and how it's used as a calendar. The moon is our oldest neighbour and has been around for about 4.4 billion years. Before that, well, it wasn't. Humans have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years and in that time they've looked up at the moon and started using it as a way of organising their life. Animal bones discovered in the Dijon region of France date back to about 28,000 BCE. They show a pattern of 7 or 13 notches that are believed to be the very first calendars known to man. Not surprising, man chose the moon as an object to watch. Firstly, it is the most visible object in the ancient sky and the only viable light at night, excluding fire. I'm counting the nights from no moon to full moon and back again are roughly 28 days. 
The phases could be subdivided into quarters and served as a blueprint of our week, seven day week. The word calendar derives from the Latin calendrum, which means register and structure. Therefore, it became possible to structure festivals, daily routines and agricultural events that could be planned in advance. As well as observing the changing moon phases, they noticed changes in the flora fauna through the seasons. Around 3000 BCE, the Sumerians and later the Babylonians created the lunisolar calendar, a calendar used a combination of the cycle of the moon and the sun. The cycle of the moon made the months fairly consistent in length, and the rotation of the sun allowed for the days and years to be regular in length. The Babylonian lunisolar calendar is the basis for several religious calendars. 5,000 years ago on the other side of Europe, the Gaelic inhabitants of Ireland were busy carving Neolithic art on giant rocks called curbstones at Noth Passage Tomb. Of the 127 curbstones at Noth, 90 appear to be megalithic art, many of astronomical carvings like groups of stars, one is a possible sundial, another a solar eclipse. And it seems the work on Curbstone 78 appears to be a lunar calendar. The Antikythera mechanism is generally referred to as the first known analog computer and calendar used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. Believed to have been designed and constructed by Hellenistic scientists, and it is dated to about, well, between 87 and 205 BCE. The Antikythera mechanism is operated by the action of turning the hand crank that would also cause all the interlocking gears within the mechanism to rotate, resulting in the simultaneous calculation of the position of the sun, the moon, the moon phase, eclipse and calendar cycles, and perhaps the location of planets. The mechanism is thought to be able to calculate leap years and the 1 in 76 year calific cycle correction. There are some issues with using the moon as a calendar. Uh, let's have a look at it point by point, starting with a full moon. Let's say the next full moon on Monday the 27th of November, it's at 8.16 p.m. and the, moon, the full moon will be near the Pleiades asterism. The moon will circle the Earth in about 27 and a third days to be back at the same background sky position it was previously. This is the sidereal lunar month or tropical lunar month. This may be okay, but the moon will take another couple of days to return to the same phase, e.g. full moon. This is actually 29.53 days. That period is called the synodic lunar month. The 12 synodic months or 12 returns to the full moon equals one lunar year. However, if you count how many times the moon has passed the Pleiades, you will get 13 passes equal to one lunar year. 12 full moons and 13 times to the same starry background. The lunar year is exactly 354.372 days long, or 11 whole days shorter than the solar tropical year. So to compensate every couple of tropical years, we have a lunar leap year, 13 synodic months or 14 tropical months in the calendar year. Now if counted through year after year, you will find it takes 235 synodic months, which is equal to 254 tropical lunar months, equal to 19 tropical years. For the moon to return to the same phase, a.e. a full moon, with the same background stars, e.g. near the Pleiades. This is a metonic cycle, named after Meton of Athens, a Greek mathematician of 500 BCE. The ecliptic cycle is a further improvement, an approximate common multiple of the tropical year and the synodic month. Proposed by Calippus in 330 BCE, it is a period of 76 years 
as a common correction to the 19-year metonic cycle. The Jewish calendar has 12 months in a typical year and 13 in a leap year. Its calculation is based on the lunar phase. While years normally 354 days, but 384 in a leap year, are based on the revolutions of the sun around the earth. The Sefer Ebrenot, published in the early 17th century, <clears throat> is a guide that contains the rules and information necessary to calculate the Jewish calendar. Instead of diagrams and tables, it makes use of wheels that can be superimposed one on the other as an aid for complicated calculations. As mentioned before, the Hebrew lunisolar calendar is believed to be based on the older Babylonian lunisolar calendar system. Moon calendars are very much in use in the modern world. <clears throat> this example of the Islamic calendar, uh, or also known as the Arabic calendar or Hajiri calendar, is generally mixed with the Gregorian calendar. The first day of Muharram is the first month of the Islamic calendar. This starts the Islamic New Year, 1445. The Hajari calendar is based on the lunar calendar, which consists of 12 months. A new month begins when the new moon is sighted. Muslims use the Islamic calendar to work out key religious events and dates. Similarly, the Chinese calendar has 12 or 13 months per year. The date on the Chinese calendar is about 20 to 50 days behind the Gregorian calendar. This year, 2023, is the year of the rabbit, with 13 months in the Chinese lunar calendar. The Chinese calendar is based on both the moon's orbit around the Earth and the Earth's orbit around the sun. According to the Chinese calendar, 2023 is the year of the rabbit. It is from January the 22nd, 2023 to February the 9th of 2024 in the Gregorian calendar. The year 2023 has 384 days, including a leap month in the Chinese lunar calendar. A new month on the Chinese calendar begins when the moon moves in line with the earth and the sun, i.e. a new moon. The full moon comes at the middle of the month. The full moon to full moon is about 29.5 days. Therefore, in a lunar month has 29 or 30 days. North America, names have been given to each full moon. The moon names used in the Old Farmer's Almanac come from Native American, Colonial American, and other traditional North American sources passed down through generations. An example is the name of January's Wolf Moon. It's not a traditional Native American name. It is thought to have English origins and was brought to North America by European settlers. I'm not forgetting that astronomers also need a calendar. This one shows the four lunar phases throughout the year of 2023 for observers in the Southern Hemisphere. And thank you for listening and my humble apologies for any mispronounced words or names of calendars. Thank you, Merv. There were some interesting details about our moon from past to present. Let's now go to a news break. Houston-based Ad Astra rocket company is forging a time in space history with its development of the variable specific impulse magneto plasma rocket engine. The company is aiming to go further, faster, for longer, using a tenth of the fuel that's required in rockets of today. Space can have an adverse effect on astronauts over time. To minimise space travel benefits everyone. Using electricity, they'll convert gas to plasma. The question is, how hot can you make exhaust? It needs to be one to two million degrees. The desired results? Easy, affordable, efficient, fast, in-space transportation. Tests continue.
we now have Steve. He will talk about the relationship between the moon, superstition and human behaviour. Well, good evening, everyone. So how do you react to the he uh, to hear the sound of a wolf howling at the moon? This is, there is something very primordial about the moon, which somehow occupies a deep part of our collective consciousness. Tonight, I'm going to talk about lunar lunacy, or does the moon somehow influence human behavior? Over eons of time, we have evolved to feel weary of the night especially during a full moon when our imagination begins to envisage all sorts of scary creatures lurking just out of sight. Imaginary creatures such as witches, werewolves and vampires are all associated with the full moon. And over time, the moon has become ingrained in our cultural heritage. For example, we have based our calendar on the orbit of the moon. Indeed, the word month is based on the word moon. It has become a goal for people to strive for. It has also become a symbol of romance. But deep down, our ancestral heritage has taught us to somehow associate the moon with an impending sense of doom. For example, science fiction and horror movies and books often present the moon in a threatening sort of way. And who can forget classic songs such as Bad Moon Rising by Credence Clearwater Revival? I'm sure you can think of many more examples. The moon has even influenced the development of our language. For example, the word lunacy, meaning extreme foolishness or mental illness, is derived from the ancient Roman goddess of the moon known as Luna. But can the moon influence human behaviour? For centuries, people have considered that the moon must influence human behaviour. For example, the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle noted that the moon caused the tides and surmised that as the brain was the moistest of the organs, the moon must influence the brain as well. Since then, and probably even before then, people all over the world have noted weird connections between the full moon and changes in both human behaviour and biology. This relationship is known as the lunar lunacy effect. Here are some of the observations that people have made where the moon is supposed to influence human behavior and biology. Fertility. The human menstrual cycle is 28 days. Since this is the amount of time it takes for the moon to orbit the earth, people have suggested that the moon must be involved in this cycle as well. Birth rate. More babies appear to be more born during a full moon. Blood loss. Some surgeons reportedly refuse to operate during a full moon due to the higher risk of blood loss. There appears to be a negative correlation between epileptic seizures and the full moon. Violent crime appears to increase during a full moon. There appears to be more vehicle accidents during a full moon. The stock market losses are reported to be higher in the period leading up to a full moon. And suicide rates appear higher during a full moon. And lastly, sleep quality appears to be poorer during a full moon. But is all this true? Well, the short answer is no. Now, a meta-analysis of 37 studies that examine the relationships between the moon's four phases and human behaviour revealed no significant correlation. The authors found that of 23 studies that claim to show a correlation, nearly half contained at least one statistical error. Similarly, in a review of 20 studies examining correlations between moon phase and suicides, most of the 20 studies found no correlation, and the ones that did report positive results or, uh, <laughs> uh, report positive results were inconsistent with each other. 
A 1978 review of the literature also found that lunar phases in human behaviour are not related. Furthermore, all of the studies are simple correlational studies. This means that causality cannot be established. For example, the full moon cannot cause road accidents any more than road accidents can cause the full moon. Instead, it's much more likely that road accidents are simply caused by inattentive drivers. Similarly, while the human menstrual cycle is 28 days, this only applies to humans and no other mammals. It's just a coincidence. So in conclusion, the moon is just a big rock in space which can influence the oceans and the atmosphere because of gravity. While the moon's gravity can cause tidal shifts in the oceans, individual humans are so small in comparison to the oceans that the effect of the moon's gravity on individuals is negligible. Gravity has not been shown to do anything mystical or psychological to the objects it acts upon. Oh, and wolves don't actually howl at the moon. So here are some references that I've, I can um, I can share with you. And thank you. And back to share uh, back to Petra. Thank you, Steve. Your insights and truths have been enlightening. Next year's supermoons, blue moons and moon illusions, what are they? Jackie is about to tell you. Supermoons, blue moons and the moon illusion. What are supermoons? Well, they're particularly big full moons uh, that are close to the Earth. They used to be known as perigee full moons. That was their technical term. And the term supermoon only came about in 1976. And this was thought up by an astrologer, Richard Knoll. And the term itself didn't really take off until about 15 years ago. So what's actually happening here? So the moon's orbit is slightly elliptical and as it goes around it ends up being slightly closer at one point and slightly further away at the other. So at its closest point it's around about 363,000 kilometres away and it's furthest around about 400 and 500,000 kilometres away. And the furthest point is called Apogee and the closest point is called perigee. Supermoons are around about 14% bigger in the sky. They're also around about 30% brighter. And that's because of what we call the inverse square law. Uh, so the light is about four times brighter than it should be. We also get what are called king tides at around perigee. So the tides are a little bit higher than usual. And this can be important if you have a bad weather event around this time. The, tides can be even higher again. Supermoons are roughly 413 days apart. So that's one year, one month and 18 days. This year in 2023, we had one on the 30th of August. So the next pair will be in September and October next year. And the year 
after that will be uh, early November and December. And the following year will be late December and late January. So you may get excited about hearing about the supermoons when they turn up in the social media and you think, great, I am going to go outside and take a photo of this because it sounds fantastic. And you go outside and you see this beautiful yellow moon rising just on the horizon and you get your phone out and you get ready to take an image. And it just turns out looking like a little dot on your photo. You've been sucked into the moon illusion. Now we still don't quite know what's going on in our brain uh, when this happens and why the moon looks bigger on the horizon than it does when it's higher up in the sky. But one of the best explanations we have is called the Ponzi illusion. And we're trying to demonstrate it here. Now the moon that is down on the lower part of the screen is actually the moon that you would see up higher in the sky. So if you just turn this around, that's kind of the way you're seeing it. So it's uh, kind of like when you've got uh, some, yeah, just, just twist it around, stand on your head. Yeah, so our, our brain's doing some weird things with some optical illusions there. We've also got the term blue moon, and you can actually physically get a blue moon when you have lots of volcanic dust in the air. Um, and maybe lots of uh, bushfire smoke as well. But usually it is referring to when you get an additional full moon occurring in a season. Now this is the true traditional term for a blue moon. Uh, I know we tend to call a blue moon a second full moon in a calendar month. This is actually a mistake. And it was started back in the 1940s by Sky and Telescope magazine in the US uh, when they misunderstood a farmer's almanac. And uh, it's sort of carried on into the present day. So I think this one's going to be a little bit hard to undo. But this here on the screen is the real definition of a blue moon, the third of four full moons in a three month season. So there's our full moons. Uh, do enjoy them and I'm sure you will get at least one of these moons somewhere in your lifetime. Thank you, Jackie. Now we all know what a blue moon actually means. Okay, guys, just reaching out to you out there. I've seen a lot of comments, but I haven't seen enough questions. So bring on those questions because don't forget, we have a planet sphere to give away tonight. Do you know that the moon has a role in determining the ocean tides? If not, you're about to learn all about this from Andrew. Evening all. Um, I hope that picture is up there and that you're sharing it with me. Let me check. No, wrong one. Okay. Just wait a moment. This worked beautifully the other day. Um, uh, let me see. Bear with me. Um, the wrong thing has come up. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll fix it now. I've been trying to fix it already, so sorry. 
Now let's hope this one is the right one. That looks right. Yep, all set. Very good. Yeah. Let's run it for you. Okay, hopefully that's all right now. Is that all right, Petra? Apologies. Okay, good day every day at coastal locations all over our planet. People observe these shifting tides. Some, like fishermen, boating enthusiasts and port authorities uh, and local councils need to know ahead of time whether the tide will be in or out or somewhere in between. Our Earth is the only planet in the solar system that has that is large enough quantities of liquid water to form oceans. It also has two large bodies close by whose gravitational pull is strong enough to have a significant effect on those oceans. One is the sun, 150 million kilometers away, but huge. The other is our moon, just 400,000 kilometers away or thereabouts. The gravitational pull of the moon causes our oceans to be attracted towards it. But why is there another bulge on the opposite side of the Earth away from the moon? Not only is the moon revolving around the Earth, but the Earth also, to some extent, revolves around the moon. The inertia of the water in the oceans means it tends to continue on in a straight line. So it bulges away from the moon to a point where the Earth's gravity and the tendency to go straight on are balanced. As a result, there'll be two high tides and two low tides each day. The atmosphere also has tides, would you believe, and it can be a kilometer deeper between high and low atmosphere tides. And even the continents have tidal movement, but it's only a matter of centimeters and it's not noticeable. As I already mentioned, there is another object that affects the tides, the sun. And even though it's much further away, it's much more massive. So the height and time of high and low tides is significantly also dependent on the relative positions of the moon and the sun. The sun contributes up to 39% of the tidal effect. Here, thanks to redshift, we can see the positions of the sun, moon and earth on October the 15th last month. All three are in close to a straight line and the lunar phase is new moon. The sun and moon are both pulling in the same direction, so we expect a higher tidal effect and what is called a spring tide. These tables show the moon rise, set, and what we call meridian passing, which is when the moon reaches its highest point, has the times for those and the high and low tide times for Newcastle on the New South Wales coast on October the 14th and 15th. You can also see the distance to the moon and the height of the high tide. When I first brought up these tables when preparing the presentation, I fully expected to see an obvious correlation between the position of the moon and the height of the tide. There is a somewhat loose correlation between the time interval from meridian passing to meridian passing on consecutive days and the time interval between high tides, but not what I expected. The moon rises and sets on average about 50, 50 minutes later each day, but the time differences don't match this. Obviously, there are many factors which determine the figures on these tables. Here is the sun, moon, earth positions on October the 22nd, a week later. And there is about a 90 degree angle between the, um, uh, the earth sun line and the earth moon line. And the lunar phase is first quarter moon. Consequently, the tidal effect of the moon is counteracted by the side on effect of the sun. The table shows a lower tide 
due to this interaction, and this is called a nip tide. On October the 29th, we had a full moon. In fact, observable from some parts of Earth, there was a lunar eclipse as the Earth, Moon and Sun were completely aligned. The Sun and Moon are pulling in the same line, even though it is in opposite directions. So the gravitational and inertial effects are working together, producing another spring tide, even higher than the last one. On November the 5th, we had a last quarter. And again, there is a 90 degree difference between the effect of the sun and moon. So another nip tide. This is November the 12th, and the moon has almost completed a full orbit of the Earth. Just before it's a new moon again. And again, we expect a high, high tide. And it is. Now we can see one of the other influences on tide height. If you compare the three spring tide heights and the distance to the moon, you'll see that the highest spring tide occurred when the moon was closest to the earth. And in fact, it was just about what Jackie was talking about. It's almost like a king tide. As I mentioned, there are many other factors that affect the timing and the height of the tides. This map shows how tide heights vary around the world. The greatest differences between low and high tide marks might be expected to be around the equator, but the moon's orbit is not always in the same plane nor in the plane of the equator, so that is not the case. Other factors affecting tides are the depth of the water, the shape of the basin in which it sits, the features on the ocean floor, land masses, and the shape of the coastline. Some of the largest tidal differences occur in Canada and England, where the water's height can vary by as much as 11.7 metres. You can see that very clearly in these two pictures. Broome in WA has a low and high tide difference of 10 metres. Millions of years ago, some fish evolved that could survive for some time out of the water. They couldn't go far from the water, but they might have been safe between high and low tide lines. Over time, swim bladders became lungs, and evolution continued to amphibians, then land animals like reptiles and mammals, and eventually us. We are products of the moon's influence on our oceans. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the educational presentation about the tides and showing how this works. And now for another news break. The Osiris Rex asteroid study finally makes it back to Earth from Bennu. The mission began September 2016. Samples landed safely in Utah September 24, 2023. This ended a seven-year mission that saw a small spacecraft land on an asteroid, collect samples and bring them back to Earth in an effort to find answers about the primordial solar system. Scientists couldn't wait to start analysing the 250 grams of rock and soil collected from asteroid Bennu. A first for NASA. Next stop, the asteroid of Office in 2029. We now have Neil talking to you about the geology of the moon. We look at the moon countless times in our life. 
But really do we stop and think about it as a place, what it's made of and how it came to be. But the story of the moon hides a secret, an extremely violent past, which completely reshaped the earth and bound the two on a much deeper level than just gravity. Our celestial neighbor is very different from the earth, but our similarities are greater than you might think. The moon is a large, mostly gray sphere of rock about the width of Australia. It has a mass of approximately 81 billion billion tons, about 1% the mass of the earth and orbits at an average distance of about 380,000 kilometers. It is mostly solid rock with minimal activity, but is believed to have a tiny solid iron core with a small liquid mantle. Because of its size, it is cooled to the point that it is almost completely solid. Unlike the Earth, the Moon has no atmosphere, no liquid water and no tectonic plates. The mechanisms that shape, erode and shift the Earth's surface do not exist on the Moon. The only significant contributor to lunar erosion is meteor impact. Throughout its history, the Moon has experienced a constant bombardment from the leftover debris from the formation of the solar system. Initially the bombardment was furious, but over billions of years diminished into a relatively calm and stable state today. The whole surface of the Moon is covered in an ultra-fine dust called lunar regolith, created by tiny micrometeorites pulverizing the surface. While it may look soft and fluffy, it's anything but. More on that in a moment. The most obvious features on the Moon, as seen from Earth, are the maria, or seas, so called because they looked like giant bodies of water to ancient eyes. In fact, these are giant lava plains, formed relatively early in the Moon's history when it was still molten under the crust. Huge impacts by large asteroids broke through the crust, causing large flows of lava to flood the basins created by the impact. Then they cooled into wide, relatively flat surfaces. The reason they look darker from Earth is that they are relatively smooth and don't scatter sunlight as much as the rougher, mountainous highlands do. Part of the reason this lava flowed so widely across the Moon is because of a quirk of gravity. Because the Moon is large relative to the Earth and not completely even in its structure, the heavier part of the Moon was more attracted to the Earth. Over millions of years, this caused its rotation to slow down to the point that one side of the Moon always faces the Earth. This helped pull the lava which made the Maria much like the moon pulls on our seas with the tides. The far side of the moon has far fewer maria than the Earth's side. So how did it all begin? What's the moon's big secret? The Apollo missions taught us a great deal about the moon. Seismographs revealed the inner structure, telling us that the moon has a much smaller iron core than it should. And rock samples brought back show that most of the Moon's composition is very similar to that of the Earth's mantle. Alongside other evidence, this led to the shocking conclusion that more than 4 billion years ago, a planetesimal about the size of Mars impacted with the primordial Earth. This literally Earth-shattering event completely melted both bodies and sent vast quantities of material into space. This simulation shows the incredible violence of the event, but also the beautiful gravitational dance that ended up forming the Earth-Moon pair. The iron at the core of the impactor quickly fell back and became part of the Earth's iron core, while large portions of the Earth's mantle were flung up, much of it eventually becoming the Moon. Now that we are returning to the Moon, this time to stay, we will have the opportunity to study much more of the Moon's geology. Who knows what further secrets it will reveal. However, the very geology we study will make that a challenge. 
Remember that fluffy moon dust I mentioned earlier? Well, far from being soft, it is formed by the rocks on the moon's surface being pulverized by uncountable tiny meteorites, splintering microscopic shards of hard rock. This dust also easily collects a static electric charge from the solar winds that have baked it for billions of years. This causes it to be very clean and it sticks to everything. Apollo astronauts tracked large quantities of dust back into their lunar modules after each moonwalk. So much so that they described the air they breathed as smelling like gunpowder. Imagine fine ground glass with the stickiness of beanbag balls sticking to every surface, being breathed in from the air, getting jammed into mechanical parts and clogging up electrical components. With enough friction, it can melt and then immediately harden into rock again, thoroughly gumming up joints and bearings. The geology of our moon is both strange and familiar. Our shared history ties us closer than we ever knew, and our return there will reveal much that we don't yet know, even if some of that geology wants to keep its secrets from us. Thank you, Neil. Now we know why we have our Earth and Moon pair. In this next presentation, we have someone and something new to our show. I'm pleased to introduce you to David from MBO's Radio Astronomy Group. He will be talking to you about radio imaging of the moon. When you think of the moon, what does it remind you of? Maybe a werewolf transforming underneath a full moon in a scary movie? Or maybe something a bit more romantic, like the first kiss in Moonlight? That could be a little bit scary too. But a popular one, I think, would be the moon landing. But what about radio astronomy? Hmm, probably not on your list. Or if it is, probably down underneath cheese and monoliths. But why is this so? Let's explore this. Radio astronomy and imaging of the moon. So let's get stuck into it. So radio astronomy is a relatively new discipline in astronomy. It was discovered by accident in 1932 by Carl Jansky. Now, Jansky's telescope was limited in ele elevation, so it could only see roughly at the horizon. And it was in the lower end of the RF band. Now, this was good for detecting the galaxy, but that was about all. The work was followed up by Grote Reaver in 1937, at this time using higher frequencies of EHF band, and had this time had a steerable dish. And so this meant that a sky map could be drawn. However, even at VHF frequencies, the moon was still invisible. This is in radio, of course. And so this is shown in the plots. You can't see the little the dip of the moon or anything like that. Why is this? Well, this is because the moon, although we can see it visibly from the reflected light of the sun, the moon is a low energy emitter. Although the moon is cold, the energy from the sun warms up the moon to a couple hundred degrees Kelvin, depending on the phase of the moon. From the black body curves, now if we have a little look here at the, uh, the black body curves, we can see that a couple of hundred degrees Kelvin, we're getting the infrared range and a bit of the radio as well. So that meant that uh, basically their uh, telescopes at the time were further down and so couldn't really detect it. And this is shown by this other graph over here. And that is, if you have a look at the megahertz region, which is what Grote Reber and both Jansky were looking at, that it's actually easier to detect something that's 11,000 light years away than it is to detect our own moon, unless you shift up the frequency to the gigahertz range, and then the moon is reasonably easy to detect. Now, after World War II, an interest in the moon came not from an astronomical point of view, but from a military point of view. They wanted to start reflecting radio waves off the moon for long distance military communications. As a communication, it was not reliable due to the moon phase being changing each month, and you may not actually see the moon above you to reflect the signals off. So it, it did actually have some rather uh, bad things for this kind of application. But because they uh, did a lot of work on this, they worked out 
things about the moon's topography. They worked out things about the reflection of different radio, radio waves and what signals work best. And so if we look here, there's a, a nice little graph that they send a pulse and then sometimes later you get a reflection back. And so it was largely for detecting, you could send communications that would bounce back like say two seconds later, but it also gave you that you could range the moon and see how far the moon changed. You can do this optically as well, but this is one of the applications. Of course, this is how, how it all started. The thing about Project Diana is it launched a whole and another uh, sort of discipline of astronomy, and that is radar astronomy, where you send out signals and bounce them off objects like, uh, say, for instance, asteroids or other planets. Now, radar mapping of the moon. Uh, Project Diana led on to other projects that had the similar sort of uh, different antennas, a, a little bit more high gain. And it was a useful test target of the moon because you could develop other techniques that you can use for looking at asteroids, etc. Initially, the radar pulses were transmitted to the moon and bounced back to measure distance, like on the previous slide, but the moon is not flat. So the wavefront of the radar pulse coming out would reflect back from different parts of the moon at different times. Now, if we have a look at this diagram here, the closest point at the center would reflect back first. And then later, the a couple of <laughs> slight time delay in, in fractions of a second, number two, number three, rotating out until the edge. Now, this reflection would actually contain, uh, depending on the surface, the reflections, you would actually get some information about the topography. Now, as we can see in this pulse here, if the pulse comes here, the reflected nothing because it's space, and then you have your area one, area two, area three, etc. And so that was how, now that's good, but it doesn't tell you too much about the, that only tells you about the rings or, or, or you know, as the pulse stretches out over the moon. How do we get other information? Now this extra information can come from something called the Doppler shift. The moon, as it rotates around the earth, it has an effect on the reflected radar signal. Now, as the moon slowly rotates, it has an approaching side and a receding side, which is shown by this diagram. This is the approaching side, it's a receding side. And what happens is that the, the approaching side, the pulse reflected will be shifted slightly higher in frequency. And on the receding side, it'll be reflected back at a slightly lower frequency. The amount of shift in frequency is proportional to the distance away from the uh, center of the moon. And so this means that you can tell some information about how far away that the pulse is coming from from center. And so that means you can decode a plot of the moon's surface. The information contained in the radar pulse can be deconvolved into a 2D image map. The adjacent image was taken by the Millstone radar in the United States in 1960. Each line has been scaled or normalized and that's because you'll get less reflection right off the edges of the moon. And the vertical peaks indicate the amount of signal. So it requires a bit of imagination and squinting to see an image of the moon, but I can't really make Copernicus out here, but the, the, it's a real image, but it's just not what we're used to seeing. However, in the 1950s and 60s, several improvements were made with the technology of radio astronomy. Better receiver sensitivity, the detection of high frequencies and the construction of larger dishes enabled astronomers to image the moon without the need to transmit high energy radar pulses. These developments were useful for detecting faraway galaxies, but as you can see, the result of the image of the moon is fairly underwhelming. One can see the moon's texture, but it's not really high resolution. These images can be color mapped to show the warmest regions of the moon's surface. Now, imaging the moon throughout the month will show a change in temperature. And now the peak is actually not during the full moon. It's a little bit later due to the thermal inertia. These images, you can see there's a little bit more texture and that's because the actual, they were using a two millimeter wavelength. Now that is like a, a couple of thousand times larger than light, but it's still very reasonable resolutions for uh, radar. And, and radio astronomy.
This radio image of the moon was scanned by a one metre small dish in August 2023. Although sensitive enough, this shows the difficulty of obtaining high resolution pictures with a smaller size dish. This was actually taken during a storm, so the moon is detectable even on a cloudy night with radio astronomy. Hopefully, uh, with uh, MBO's new two metre dish, we should be able to get a better image in the future. Most of the time in radio astronomy, it's always moving forward because there are always new develops in either in computer technology or in electronics. And this is one recent instrumentation upgrade. They're using a colorimeter array as a detector. So in a funny way, it's kind of like a low resolution camera. Instead of using a single point at the focal point of a dish, they have an array of uh, detecting elements. Of course, this looks really nice, but it's still not as good as you can see with your eye. If we take the technology to the limit, the very large array of radio telescopes, which is about 10 telescopes across several countries, has created this high resolution image of the Apollo 15 landing site. This is probably the most high resolution picture you can take from Earth, having a resolution of roughly around about five meters. Now, the very large array is quite big. And as you can see here, the amount of locations required. So if we have a look, we've got, uh, of course, across the United States, Canada, uh, and other countries that are participating. But the amazing thing about this is that the resolution that you can get is the highest that you can get because optical telescopes, of course, have atmospheric aberrations. This is something that doesn't affect radio astronomy that much. So we can actually look here at the Tycho crater and it's amazing the resolution that you can get down to. In conclusion, the moon has been a challenging object for radio astronomers to image. Unlike stars that emit massive amounts of energy, the moon is a low temperature emitter. Early attempts utilized energy reflected from high output radar transmitters to build up a simple image of the moon. However, after many decades, radio astronomy has cre created much better images and can now produce the highest resolution images of the moon that can be taken from the Earth's surface, albeit with a large array of dishes. So now, when you think of the moon, yeah, maybe I think of radio astronomy too. Anyway, ciao. Thank you, David. Radio astronomy and imaging is very cool. Look forward to learning more about it in future streams. Stay tuned for our final news break. Are there more of us out there? The Milky Way type galaxy appears to be quite popular. The discovery has revealed an array of Milky Way like galaxies that go back more than 10 billion years. The new discovery published in the Astrophysical Journal indicates that these spiral disks are 10 times more common than thought and much older than anyone had ever dreamed. The evolution of the universe takes on a new perspective Scientists are trying to get their heads around this one. Watch this space. Okay, do you remember or do you know how many Apollo missions there were? If you can't remember or don't know, that's okay because Ella will be telling you all about them. I am Chaitanya Thakar and today I am going to talk about water on the moon and the future missions to the moon. Water is important for all life on Earth. Water plays a significant role in the space industry as it opens many doors for the future travel and the space race. It can fuel up the rocket engines and the discovery of water beyond our planet Earth. It's very crucial and very important. Maria on the moon. When early astronauts look up at the moon, they were stuck by the large dark spot on its surface. In 1645, Dutch astronomer Michel van Langren published the first known map of the moon, referring to the dark spot as Maria, the Latin word for sea, and putting into writing the widely hailed view that makes the oceans on the lunar surfaces. Similar map from Johannes Havelis 
In 1647, Giovanni Riccioli and Francisco Grimaldi in 1651 were published over the next few years. Today, we know that these spots are plains of basalt created by early volcanic eruptions. American astronaut William Pickering made measurement in late 1800s that led him to conclude that the moon essentially has no atmosphere. With no clouds and no atmosphere, scientists generally agree that any water on the lunar surface would evaporate immediately. So Pickering's measurement led to a widespread view that moon is essentially dry. As scientists made headway in understanding the behavior of substance that are prone to vaporize at relatively low temperature called volatiles, theoretical physicist Kenneth Watson published a paper in 1961 describing how a substance like water could exist on moon. Watson's paper first popularized the idea that water ice could stick to the bottom of craters on the moon that never receives light from the sun. Apollo mission in 1969 and 1972 has opened another door. The Apollo era brought humans to the lunar surface for the very first time, giving researchers the opportunity to directly look at the science of water on the moon. When initially they tested the soil sample brought back from the moon, they concluded that lunar surface must be completely dry and the prospect of water wasn't seriously considered again for decades. NASA launched Clementine mission in 1994 to orbit the moon for two months and collected the information about its minerals. Clementine data suggested there was ice in permanently shadowed region of the moon. However, the images taken from the mission were too low in the resolutions, so no strong conclusion were made at the time. In 2008, researchers from Brownian University revisited the samples collected during the Apollo mission, and they find out the hydroxyl molecules in tiny beads of the volcanic ashes. Since there are no volcanoes erupting on moon today, the discovery presented evidences that the water had existed in moon when the volcanoes were erupting in the moon in very ancient past. In 2009, a suit of spacecraft enabled exciting discoveries. None were designed to look for the water on the moon, yet the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO's Chandrayaan-1 and NASA's Cassini and Deep Impact missions detected the sign of hydrated minerals in the form of oxygen and hydrogen molecules in sunlit areas of the moon. Researchers couldn't determine whether they were seeing hydration by hydroxyl and water. They also debated whether the amount of hydration depended on the time of the day or uh, another time or the time of night. The Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, LCROSS, and Lunar Reconscience Orbiter, LRO, launched together in 2009. Later that year, Elcross intensely discharged a projectile into the crater, believed that it contains water ice, and it flew past through the debris of the projectile impact. After four minutes, Elcross itself impacted on the moon's surface, while LRO observed from the far distance. The combined observation of both the uh, satellites showed that the grains of water ice are ejected in the form of mineral. LRO and Enclos's finding added to a growing body of evidences that water currently exists on the moon in the form of ice within permanently shadowed regions. LRO continued to orbit the moon and provided the data used to characterize the map of lunar surface, including the presence of hydrogen um, on the surface of the moon. Confirmation of the water moon in the shadowed region again came in the year 2018. Data from Moon Mineralogy Mapper M3 carried out by ISRO's Chandrayaan-1 
provided scientists with the first high resolution map of the minerals that make up of the lunar surface. The NASA's instrument flew abroad India's Chandrayaan-1 mission in 2009. An analysis of the full set of the data from M3 announced in 2018 revealed multiple confirmation and the locations of the water ice presence in the shadowed region of the moon. So again, this image shows um, the, image, the data which was collected by the Chandrayaan-1 and uh, the NASA's M3. In 2020, NASA announced the discovery of water on the sunlit surface of the moon as well. Data from the Strategic Observatory from Infrared Astronomy, Sophia, revealed that in Cleveland's crater, water exists in concentration roughly equivalent to 12 ounce of bottle of water within a cubic meter of soil across the lunar surface. That's all about the uh, water on the moon. Now, little information regarding future missions of the moon. So you may have heard about the Artemis mission. NASA is aiming to land the first woman and the first person of color on the surface of moon using the innovative technologies to explore more of the lunar surface than ever before. NASA is also planning to um, establish a radio telescope on the surface of moon. Uh, with the help of Artemis mission. So that's all coming in the nearby pipeline. Now, you may all have heard about the India's Chandrayaan-3 mission, where India has done a soft landing on the South Pole side of the uh, lunar surface. Now, uh, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and India's ISRO, Indian Space Research Organizations, are also planning to send another satellite and do a soft landing on uh, the south pole of moon to do the further research and studies. That's all from me, uh, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Chitani, for telling us about water on the moon and missions to the moon. And we're apologizing, obviously, we were meant to here from Ella, but unfortunately we had a few glitches with technology tonight. But sit tight because here she comes. For those who don't know who I am, my name is Ella and tonight I'm going to be telling you all about the Apollo program. Our moon, the brightest and largest object in our night sky. Without her, we'd be without a stable climate or tides. As humans, we are naturally curious creatures and it was only inevitable that one day we broadened our searches beyond our atmosphere. Flying to the moon required massive advancements in the science of flight, and the USA were very eager in achieving this mission. However, they weren't the only ones with the goal of going to the moon at the time. So were the Soviet Union. Therefore, on the 25th of May, 1961, US President John F. Kennedy announced that it was their ultimate goal of sending an American safely to the moon before the end of the decade to catch up and overtake the Soviets in the space race. As Soviet cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space on April 12th of 1961. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Over time, there were 17 Apollo missions, all the various goals and objectives. Now, as much as I'd love to talk about all 17 missions, I simply do not have enough time to do so tonight in the time frame that I have, nor would I want to rush going through them all. So tonight, I'm going to go up to the mission that changed it all, Apollo 11. But before that, I need to take you to 1967, where Apollo 1 awaits us. Apollo 1 was the very first crewed mission of the Apollo program. It was planned to be a low Earth orbital test of the command and service module with astronauts Gus Grissom, Edward White and Roger Ch Chaffee, launching on the February 21st of 1967. Unfortunately, earlier on that year, on January 27th, Tragedy struck on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy during a pre-flight test, tragically killing all three astronauts. 
Due to the exhaustive investigation of the fire and the extensive reworking of the Apollo command modules, they postponed all crewed launches until NASA officials cleared them. This meaning, Apollo missions 2 to 6 were unmanned missions due to the tragedy of the first Apollo mission. In this time, it was their purpose to understand and test scientific and engineering equipment. In order for NASA to return to using astronauts, they were insistent that it was safe for them in the lunar command modules. This now brings us to Apollo 7. Apollo 7 had the mission objectives to demonstrate a number of tests on the spacecraft. It was crewed with astronauts Wally Shearer, Don Easel, and Walt Cunningham. It was the very first human crewed mission since Apollo 1 and ran from October 11th to the 22nd of 1968, which thankfully resulted in a perfect launch. Apollo 7 completed 163 orbits of the Earth in 10 days and 20 hours in space, with the only complication was that all three astronauts developed severe head colds. The astronauts also gave several video press conferences from Earth during their flight, becoming the very first Apollo crew to broadcast live in space. Apollo 8, the first to fly to the moon. Launching on December 21st to the 27th of 1968, astronauts William Anders, Frank Borman and James Lovell Jr. They were the very first crewed spacecraft to leave Earth's low orbit and the first to the moon and completed 10 orbits of it on Christmas Eve of 1968. They had a mission duration of 6 days, 3 hours and 42 seconds. This mission was an important prelude to a lunar landing. They tested the flight trajectory and the operations of getting there and back. In this mission, the crew also produced, in my opinion, the most iconic Earthrise photo in history. Apollo 9, testing of the lunar module in Earth orbit. March 3rd to the 13th of 1969 was when Apollo 9 ran. They contained astronauts James McDivitt, David Scott and Russell Schweikart. Apollo 9 was, an, was the first mission in which it was the first crewed flight of all the lunar hardware, as well as the first crewed flight of the lunar module. With the trip around the moon completed, it was time for NASA to start seriously planning to land astronauts there. Apollo 9 carried out a full test of the lunar landing mission in Earth's orbit, and astronauts McDivitt and Schweikart tested the lunar module and rendezvoused and docked with the command and service modules. Not only this, but the lunar spacecraft, but the lunar spacesuit and backpack were also tested outside the spacecraft. Apollo 10, the rehearsal of the first moon landing. Lifting off on May 18th and returning the 26th of 1969, contained astronauts Thomas Stafford, John Young, and Eugene Kernan. It was a complete staging without landing of the moon of the next mission, which is probably the most commonly known mission, Apollo 11. They completed an entire trip to the moon, in which they were the first to travel with the entire Apollo spacecraft configuration. The crew tested all aspects of the mission, even demonstrating the initial docking with the lunar module on the first colour television transmission from space. They came within 16 kilometres of the lunar surface and even passed over the Sea of Tranquility, the site of where Apollo 11 would soon land. Apollo 11, the moon landing. On July 20th of 1969, astronaut and commander Neil Armstrong said to the world, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It was a day that marked history on Earth. No matter what age you are, everyone knows the story of Apollo 11, in which achieving the goal that President John F. Kennedy had set in 1961. Lifting off on July 16th to the 24th of 1969, Apollo 11, contained of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, were launched into space with one and only objective, to be the first to land and walk on the moon. After a landing that included dodging a lunar crater and a boulder field just before touchdown, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin explored the area around the landing site for more than two hours. They collected soil and rock samples, set up experiments, planted an American flag, and left behind a plaque honouring the Apollo 1 crew, saying, We came in peace for all mankind. The Apollo program started out as a demonstration of America's technological, economic and political superiority to the Soviets. 
It was a program that showed immense hard work and dedication from scientists, mathematicians, engineers, and so many more people that made it is what it is, even to this day. All that work that was put forth allowed the Apollo pro program, resulting in multiple shuttle launches and Saturn V rockets to launch off the Earth's surface, and only a matter of eight years led them to the surface of the moon. The astronauts brought back a wide variety of rocks, more than 362 kilograms total. They tested the limits of exploration and made history in all the same time. Since the last mission on the 19th of December 1972, we haven't been back to the moon since, but the moon has remained a great interest to NASA, Elon Musk, and scientists all over the world. But maybe, just maybe, that streak will end sooner than you think. My name is Ella Willis, thank you for joining me this evening, and I hope I can tell you more about the history of the Apollo missions in the future. Have a great night, and I'll see you soon for the Q&A. Thank you, Ella. Now we know how many Apollo missions there were. Okay, I've been seeing some questions coming to our chat. Bring them on. We love our questions so we can use them for Q&A, and don't forget, there's a planet for you to win tonight. And finally, we have an exclusive interview with our very own Braden Borg about the amazing work that he is doing in sending the first Australian payload to the moon. We welcome technical lead and systems engineer at Fleet Space Technologies in South Australia, Braden Borg. Hi, Braden. Hello, Denise. Thank you for having me. Good to have you with us. Well. You've got a very interesting job. From You work with a company called Fleet Space Technologies. Now, this is in South Australia. I didn't know that they existed, but they're part of the space program, I believe, in Australia. And you're working on a, a few projects, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but first of all, what are the mission objectives of Fleet Space Technologies? Yeah, so Fleet has this very big, what we call a hairy audacious goal uh, to connect the Earth, Moon and Mars. So we develop exploration technologies uh, that use our own in-house satellite technology that we design and, and, and get manufactured with a partner over in Europe um, and also geophysical tools that we have in-house to provide uh, near real-time insight into, into the subsurface. So what that means is, is we build um, three-dimensional models of the subsurface, so underground uh, uh, to quite a depth of around 1 to 1.5 kilometres. And we characterise the subsurface based upon different geologies, different um, physical structures, and that also allows us to specifically target uh, minerals and mineral clusters that is of value uh, to, to the industry, particularly the mining industry. Um, this tool is called Exosphere, and it's our commercial product that uh, supports the exploration of the sustainable exploration of critical minerals. Um, and it also combines the satellite technology, as I mentioned before, but also some sub, uh, some terrestrial sensors called the geode, uh, which do all the hard work in collecting the data, and they send that up to the satellites. That sounds fascinating. I believe also one of your projects that you're uh, leading, uh, te technically leading at work, uh, is a small seismic payload. Uh, is this similar to what you're doing with the minerals uh, when you're, you know, you're looking into the ground and the geology of the ground? Yes, it's it's very much sort of like uh, an evolution of that family. So our core product, Exosphere, uses uh, uh, devices called the geode. So the geode is the terrestrial seismometer that gets deployed in the ground and talks to the satellite. And we actually use the the similar technology or the same principle um, in developing uh, some of our other exploration technologies. Um, and it all uses this uh, geophysical uh, technique called passive seismic tomography, ambient noise tomography. Um, and essentially it's a method of detecting very like low frequency hums and vibrations in the ground passively. So nothing's generated. We just put these devices in the ground and, and listen to the seismic hum. And we can actually use that information to characterize uh, the material or basically the subsurface that 
those signals have traveled through. So it's purely passive and uh, very much sustainable in that regard. And this payload, I believe, is being developed in preparation to send it to the moon. Yes, that's correct. So that will pick up a few of those moon quakes, I should imagine. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a very interesting type of environment on the moon because unlike the Earth, it's very quiet on the moon. You know, the Earth has uh, lots of weather events. It has uh, a lot of um, sort of man-made structures or vehicles, there's machinery and plantations, um, all sorts of, uh, of, of noise generating sources, but on the moon, it's rather quiet. However, there is, uh, other than moon, uh, moon earthquakes or moon quakes, as you, as you suggested very rightly, there are also uh, micrometeorite impact events, which do, when they hit the ground or hit the lunar surface, generate these signals, these, these seismic signals, and uh, we're aiming to detect those seismic signals and use it to do um, a similar type of characterization that we do here on Earth. So this is just really a tip of the iceberg of what you actually do at uh, the Fleet Technologies, uh, the Fleet Space Technologies in South Australia. What else do you do in your role? Yeah, so I'm a systems engineer um, and my role uh, also involves being a technical lead. So I work with all disciplines in my team and I also work across other teams in, in my company as well. So we have a lot of projects on, we have the satellite systems that get developed, we have these ground-based seismometers, the geode get, that gets developed and a lot of the other technologies and infrastructure that connect uh, uh, all of these products together. So. Yeah, I work across different departments and I ensure that communication channels is always open and that um, everyone gets all the information that they need. So system engineers typically uh, define what we call requirements. So um, definitions of what a product needs to be able to do. And uh, we follow through with that by also defining ways of testing and verifying that the product satisfy those requirements. Uh, and that it satisfies other interfaces as well. Um, so yeah, so I, I do a lot of work there. And as a technical lead, um, uh, I am a lead to my team. So uh, I, I'm a technical role model, but I also manage them, uh, do a little bit of project management as well, and um, just aim to provide any assistance that they need, uh, both technical and managerial. What do you most enjoy about your role as an engineer? particularly in developing oh. Australian, the Australian space industry. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's super exciting. I think we're very lucky here in Australia in that we have the opportunity of developing this space industry. And in Australia, historically, we have had an industry um, in defense and aerospace engineering, so aircraft and satellites but also a lot of the ground-based technologies used for like radar um, and even, even today, like Wi-Fi, for example, in that telecommunications sector. So we've had a lot of involvement in that type of industry, but nothing to the extent that America or Europe has developed, obviously, over uh, several, several decades. So um, we're in a very unique position where we get to build up the space industry in Australia. Um, and it's not necessarily built up just through the government we're actually building up the space industry through startup companies, independent companies like Fleet Space Technologies, who has its own goals and ambitions, has its own commercial um, uh, sort of modus operandi, but ultimately does contribute to the space industry and works well with other companies to help bolster uh, this sort of new space 2.0 that we call it um, in Australia. Most recently, You've been involved in the development of a small seismic payload called SPIDER. Can you tell us a bit about what this SPIDER project entails? Yes. So um, a, a part of what we're saying, putting something on the moon, the SPIDER is the device that we aim to put on the moon. So the demonstrator mission, which this SPIDER sort of falls under, uh, is financed by the uh, Australian Department of Industry, and it's also sp uh, supported by the Australian Space in Industry. Um, uh, namely the space agency. So uh, it is a exploration project and it uses what we call a commercial lunar payload services delivery system. So those who are sort of familiar with what NASA and uh, ESA are doing through the Artemis project, there's something called a CLPS, which is this 
commercial lunar payload services. And it's an opportunity, it's very exciting. It's an opportunity for uh, any company really, uh, if you have the money um, to pay for a ride uh, with these lunar landers and and put your um, your payload, your sensor, your science project um, pretty much directly on the surface of the moon. So it's really exciting times where you don't have to be um, uh, necessarily working for the government or working for one of these big space bodies uh, to contribute to this sort of exploration of the moon. Um, we now have like smaller companies and potentially even universities as well uh, being able to contribute to that. So uh, the way that uh, Fleet Space is, is contributing is through the development of the SPIDER. Um, which is an acronym for uh, the Seismic Payload for Interplanetary Discovery, Exploration and Research. And it is essentially just a small little device that looks a bit like a spider uh, that will be dropped from the lander upon landing on the lunar surface, and it will collect seismic data to do similar type of processing that we do here on Earth um, to characterize uh, lunar regolith, especially for the lunar surface. What is the Artemis mission? And for those who aren't too familiar with it, why is it important to return to the moon and do such experiments? Yes, it's, it's an excellent question. And uh, really space has sort of been a, a massive part of some people's lives. And, and NASA has been an excellent example of, of progress made towards um, exploring the moon, but we haven't been back to the moon for a very, very long time. We've had a lot of um, orbiters, a lot of satellites, uh, both um, in space, but also specifically to orbit other planetary bodies. But we haven't landed in such a long time. And, and Artemis is going to be the first mission where we go back to the moon. And we're going back to the moon with um, our first female astronaut to walk on the moon, a person of color as well. And it's also going to be uh, an opportunity to kind of continue to expand this commercial lunar payload services um, infrastructure uh, so that other companies can be involved in this space exploration and and understanding more about the lunar surface and, and how we can actually utilize the moon uh, as a more persistent base of operations. So it's not just about going to the moon to do just science. It's now actually doing science so that we can actually expand our civilization and set up the infrastructure to go from the moon to Mars and then even beyond. So there's a lot of persistency there and uh, uh, a lot of groundwork that needs to be done first before we can really commit to um, all these big plans that uh, that NASA, ESA, and now Australia um, sort of have uh, in the works. Well, thank you, Braden, for joining us today on NAMBO. Wish you very much um, good luck and, and well-being for all the, the things that you're about to accomplish and getting us all back to the moon. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Brayden. This is very exciting times for you and for Australia. That was the last of our speakers for this evening, but stick around to learn more about who we are and what MBO is about before we head into questions and answers. Mount Bennett Observatory is a community-run astronomical society in the Dandenong Ranges. We are completely volunteer-run and have over 500 members. We focus on community engagement, outreach, diversity, and helping our members to get the most out of their love of space and astronomy. The observatory was originally built by Monash University for students to do astronomical research, especially on variable stars stars whose brightness changes over time. Over the next two decades, the site was expanded and upgraded, but eventually took a back seat to modern giant internet connected observatories around the world. In 2011, our five founding members reached an agreement with the landowners and took over the lease and established the society. Now, we run over 80 events each year, including members' nights, public viewings, and special events. We have several special interest groups, including deep sky observing, radio astronomy, astrophotography, astro arts, and young observers. 
In 2020, we expanded our online presence and now host regular live streaming events. We welcome all new members and love making new friends with other astronomy lovers. You will be joining a friendly community of passionate, hardworking amateurs who have a grand vision for the future of the observatory. We hope to see you up at MBO soon. Hello everyone. We hope you are enjoying the stream. Coming up next is the question and answer segment, but first, some important messages. MBO is a volunteer-run organisation. If you'd like to support us, consider becoming a member, buying some MBO merch, or making a donation. You can find us on social media at these addresses. The live streams are created by a talented and diverse team. You can read the names of those involved below. Now it's time for Q&A. Okay. I now invite all the panellists to join me for the Q&A segment. All right, looks like we're all here. And the first question tonight goes to, um, actually the first question tonight was by Brian. And Brian has said, so did the Earth make the moon? And I think, Neil, you could answer this one. I'll take that one, yes. So um, it's not exactly the case that the Earth made the moon. And in a way, you could say that the moon made the Earth because when it originally occurred, the giant impact was between the protoplanet that became Earth and another giant protoplanet about the size of Mars, which people have dubbed Theia. Now, Thea is in Greek myths and legends the daughter, sorry, the mother of Selene, who is the moon of um, Greek myths and legends. So, in a way, the mother giving birth to the moon, Thea giving birth to our moon. It's a nice poetic um, explanation there. But those two large planetesimals, pre planets, um, they became the Earth and the moon, but beforehand, neither of them were really the Earth or the moon. Uh, what became the Earth? was smaller and a lot of the material that was in uh, Thea or Thea ended up as part of the earth. So in a way, it created both of us. So before the impact, there was a planetesimal that would become the earth and another one called Thea that would become the moon. And it's only as a result of the impact when the two of them came together, massively mixed up the contents and shared them between them with a lot of the mantle from the earth becoming the moon and all, or almost all of the iron from Thea going into the Earth. That's how we ended up with that pair. So the Earth didn't really create the moon. It was two pre-planet planetesimals in the early solar system that collided and shared their contents, and that ended up becoming the Earth-Moon pair. Thank you, Neil. Um I'm now going to ask the question from Grace and I'm going to ask it to Stu because Stu has kindly popped into the stream tonight. Everybody say hi to Stu. So this question, Stu, goes to you. It's so the sun has more effect than the moon. Yeah. Um, so gravitationally, uh, the sun has a stronger gravitational force on the earth than the moon because we are orbiting around the, the sun completely. Um, and the moon kind of perturbs us a bit, but uh, yeah, obviously the, the sun is dominating our gravitational environment here. But when we're talking about tidal forces, um, it's not directly proportional to the exact strength of gravity. It's actually related to the 
the rate of change of gravity. So if the, the strength of gravity is stronger on one side of the Earth compared to the other. And um, gravity is uh, the strength of gravity is proportional to 1 over distance squared. So as you get 2 times further away, you get 4 times less gravity. But uh, tidal forces, long story short, are 1 over distance cubed. So if you're 2 times further away, you um, decrease the tidal forces by 8. Um, so, although the sun is a lot larger than the moon, it's also a lot further away. And when it comes to tides, that really matters. And so, if you crank through the maths, and I got my calculator out here just to make sure it was correct, um, the moon's tidal forces on the Earth are roughly two to three times stronger than the sun. So they're actually pretty comparable. It's they they um, especially for the different sizes and masses that they have, but. Um, so the sun does have a small effect on the moon, as was covered in some presentations earlier on. But um, the moon has the dominant tidal effect of two to three times more strength. Thank you, Stu. That was awesome. I'm sure Grace understands now how that works. And for the last question for the night, and it's our winning question tonight, and this has been asked by Katie. And the question is, what's the statical likelihood of the moon so perfectly covering the sun in an eclipse it does seem quite poetically amazing and i think i have neil answering this one yes i'll take that one great question katie um it's actually uh one of co the uh fantastic cosmic coincidences in life that we are extremely lucky to uh be able to benefit from when the moon, moon was first formed it was quite a lot closer to the Earth. And over the billions of years of its life, its orbit has gradually been increasing. It's been receding away from the Earth. Uh, a bit of trivia, it actually does that at about the same rate at which your fingernails grow. So if you imagine how long it's been since you last clipped your fingernails, um, the next time you clip them, that's how far away the moon has moved in that time from the Earth. So the Angular size of the moon is just about right to cover the sun during an eclipse. Yes, thank you, Aki. He wants to contribute to answering this question as well. Um, but it's not always that way. As Jackie pointed out in her presentation, the orbit of the moon around the Earth is an ellipse, and sometimes it's closer and sometimes it's further away, so a 14% difference. And that means sometimes the moon isn't quite big enough to completely cover the sun, and so we get a ring of the sun shining around the dark silhouette of the moon and that's what we call an annular eclipse there was actually one of those just a month or two ago so we are extraordinarily lucky that at this particular time in the history of our solar system that the correct positioning of the earth relative to the sun and the moon means that we are able to get total solar eclipses a few millions or billions of years ago, the moon would have been much bigger and would have covered the sun almost completely, which would have been, a well, when I say almost completely, more than completely, um, it would have been an interesting um, view to see that. We'd have seen the corona outside the edges much still, but we wouldn't have had that ring of fire effect. <laughs> Thank you, Aki. Um, and in the future, as the moon recedes further away, the uh, frequency of total eclipses will decrease and the uh, frequency of annular eclipses will increase um, and eventually it gets to the point where we won't get total eclipses anymore. Now this is going to happen over tens of millions of years of course um, but in the time scale of the whole solar system that's a very very small window so we have been incredibly fortunate that right at this time humanity has been alive and aware to observe these solar eclipses and um, appreciate them for just what a, a beautiful cosmic show they really are. Great question. Thank you for answering that, Neil. And Katie, could you please provide us with your details by using the email prizes at mbo.org.au so that we can send your prize out to you. Now, if your questions remain unanswered tonight, don't fret. Tune into MBO's latest show it's called celestial sunday on facebook or youtube where your burning questions may find their well-deserved spotlight 
As we conclude our show on our moon, let us reflect on the profound significance of our lunar neighbour. Our moon, a constant present in our night sky, has kindled our curiosity and imagination, inviting us to explore and understand the mysteries of the cosmos. It has been a symbol of unity, reminding us of our shared humanity and the importance of scientific endeavour. As we bid farewell to this topic, let us carry with us the inspiration and wonder that the moon instills and it may continue to guide our exploration and dreams, reminding us that the universe's secrets are there to be uncovered. I want to thank all of you for joining us on this journey and onward we soar. Good night.